Hi everyone, Dan Rossbach here, your lead discussant here at the Weird Book Book Club. Also, gay dad. A few adorable kids. Husband of a beautiful man with a beautiful mind, and general fan of all things weird. Today we're going to talk about Sayaka Murata's Convenience Store Woman, winner of Japan's prestigious Akutagawa Prize. It was released in English in 2018 and ended up on many people's best of the year lists. So what did we think of it? This review is recommended if you like routine. Comfortable, reliable routine. Stopping at nothing to conceal how weird you actually are. Narratives that are as efficient and flavorful as a convenience store corn dog. Not learning, not growing up, and still being okay. So looking at this adorable rice ball on the cover of Convenience Store Woman, or at least the American release of it, you might expect sort of a heartwarming tale of a lovable misfit, someone who reaches out to other outsiders and helps them grow with her unique brand of convenience store wisdom. But it's really not like that at all. It's actually this very deeply compelling and dark character study. The main character, Keiko, well, let's just say she has a lot of trouble reading social cues. She was sort of outed to her community as a young child when she, very efficiently, uh, broke up a fight between two classmates by hitting one of them in the head with a shovel. While Keiko sees herself very much as a pragmatist, others around her are somewhat disturbed by her inability to suss out the socially acceptable way to deal with any given situation. So, after college, she immediately joins up at a local convenience store, and there she finds almost an ideal training ground for how to socially interact. Every awkward interaction with a customer has an employee handbook approved response. Every task throughout her day has an optimal way of completing it. And over the course of more than a decade, she becomes sort of deeply entrenched in the culture of this convenience store, Smile Mart. But despite all of her best efforts to blend in, we as the reader spend a lot of time very close inside Keiko's head. And so we occasionally see flashes of this somewhat disturbing mentality that she's been trying to cover up. So that's one of the unique strengths of this book, I think, is what Sayaka Murata does with language. It's not a lot of direct confrontation or intense plot moments that build sort of the tension and the overall sense of creeping dread into the story. It's these sort of telltale ruptures of language. So for example, when Keiko notices how her and her colleagues at the convenience store are starting to adopt one another's clothing styles, their manner of speaking. She thinks of this as infection. Not social influence, infection. Food for her is feed, just simply fuel to keep her body in work-ready condition. She also has a tendency to refer to social dependence as animals or pets. There's this one very disturbing and kind of cast-off moment where she starts to deliberate how easy it would be to silence her crying newborn nephew. But for all these somewhat disturbing moments, we love Keiko. Keiko's a fighter. The true monster of this tale, it should come as no surprise, is an entitled male. This guy, Shiraha, is basically Keiko's foil, where she addresses her feelings of alienation with a desire to sort of get lost in the flow of her labor and becoming a productive member of society, Shiraha sort of sits back dejectedly and spins off these theories as to how humanity could have become so maladjusted as to not recognize his unique value. A recurring theme of these rants is the Stone Age, how humanity has failed to progress socially since the Stone Age. There are the productive alpha members of society, and everyone else is sort of given their cast-off scraps. And despite the fact that his theories are completely incoherent and unbelievable, even to someone as socially naive as Keiko, her interactions with him do start to bring out this sense of tension that her comfortable convenience store lifestyle may have an expiration date. Simply by virtue of being an early middle-aged woman who works in a part-time job, her cover story of normal convenience store employee is starting to sort of evaporate. People are beginning to question, why aren't you married? Why are you only working part-time? Keiko is completely happy with her lifestyle, and in fact almost imagines herself as 
an external organ of the convenience store. She's constantly gauging how the weather that day in Tokyo is going to affect demand for certain products. And when she's apart from the convenience store, she even imagines it sort of floating over her like a benevolent spirit or Obi-Wan Kenobi at the end of that Star Wars film. And so a plot begins to develop where she contemplates taking in Shiraha as a pet to continue to enhance her cover story of being a normal, functional member of society. And Shiraha, being sort of the leeching ne'er-do-well that he is, encourages her to quit her unacceptable part-time job and pursue much more financially rewarding, but also sort of soul-destroying office work. And so that these choices are the best that society has to offer her, even in one of the world's most advanced economies. It almost seems to lend credence to Shiraha's notion that humanity has failed to progress in meaningful ways that allow for people who fall in between society's standards to find a livable position for themselves. And Murata doesn't offer any easy answers to Keiko's dilemma. If Keiko ultimately chooses to stand her ground amongst the shifting tides of store policies, new bosses, crappy co-workers, it's not because the convenience store returns all the love that she's given it, but it is a space that she can tolerate, and that can tolerate her. And maybe that's enough? So I think that Katie Waldman and her review of Convenience Store Woman for The New Yorker really did a good job of capturing this ambivalence that we feel at the end of the novel. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to read off a screen here. But for all the disturbance and oddity in Convenience Store Woman, the book dares the reader to interpret it as a happy story about a woman who has managed to craft her own good life. Murata does not judge her protagonist's path to fulfillment, nor does she spend too much time contemplating what it might mean to find transcendence in such work. Instead, she admires Keiko's quirk and lively boldness. To second-guess this woman would be to fall into her sister, Mommy's trap. Near the end of the novel, Keiko thinks to herself that Mommy is far happier thinking her sister is normal, even if she has a lot of problems, than she is having an abnormal sister for whom everything is fine. It may make readers anxious, but the book itself is tranquil, dreamy even, rooting for its employee store romance from the bottom of its synthetic heart. Mm, the sticky bits. Sticky bits. So in this segment, I try to think about what is really going to stick with me about this novel. What was really unique? If someone asked me about it, what would be the first quality that would come to my mind to recommend it to them? The first thing would be its perspective and use of language. The story really keeps you deeply in Keiko's head, in her manner of thinking for the entirety of the novel, and yet it still manages to surprise you with those linguistic ruptures that I mentioned before, those subtle, creepy uses of language that give you a sense that Keiko's manner of interpreting the world might be a lot different than we had thought, even though we're so close to her the entire time. It also does this really interesting job conveying sort of the coziness of feeling like you're a part of something larger than yourself, even when that something larger is deeply problematic, like a corporation who's going to extract a lifetime's worth of labor out of you and then cast you off like so much garbage. And then just the dead-on, deadpan satire of the modern entitled male that is Shiraha, the guy is practically a YouTube comment section incarnate. So for plot, style, scope, and overall weirdness, I give Convenience Store Woman four out of five exquisitely shelved 20-ounce beverages. It's short, it's deeply strange, it's female-centered, a truly exciting English language debut, and probably deeply relatable to anyone living in a late-stage capitalist society. Next steps, next steps. So this is the part where we talk about if you really got a buzz off of Convenience Store Woman, you're looking for something to kind of recapture that magic, what should you go for next? If you're in the mood for another sharp, deeply unromanticized portrait of a woman who feels compelled to conceal her way of thinking about the world for fear that it's going to alienate her from everyone around her, I would highly recommend Freshwater by Akweke Amezi. I'm hoping that I did not mispronounce their name too badly there. This is another novel that got a lot of buzz at the end of 2018, and rightfully so. It's amazing. Uh, it engages with themes of the cultural dissonance that's often 
experienced by immigrants in our country, elements of African folklore, the difficulties of grappling with mental illness. All of these elements are sort of bubbling together in this rich stew of a novel. Akweke Amezi is themselves a non-binary author, and queer themes are also, also prominent in this story. Sexuality is both deeply problematic for the protagonist and also a means of, by which they feel they can exert control over their life and their surroundings. So it's got a lot going on and it's all sort of wrapped up in this amazing, rich folklore that I, was my first time experiencing and I really can't wait to read more. So ditto on the unromanticized sharp portraits of women who need to conceal their ways of thinking, but also with a far more explicit focus on the linguistic ruptures that we saw in Convenience Store Woman, I would highly recommend Amatka by Karen Tidbeck, another amazing author whose name I'm probably mispronouncing. Amatka is the story of a government functionary who's sent off to a distant colony to research hygiene habits. And there's something deeply off about the society because everybody needs to constantly reinscribe all of the objects around them with their names. Language is the means by which people are literally keeping the world around them from dissolving into piles of goop. And throughout the course of this novel, you begin to suspect that the protagonist maybe wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more goop around. She conveniently forgets to involve herself in the mind-numbing, slightly soul-destroying routine of constantly etching names into every object in her surroundings. And if you're looking for more tales of outsiders who are just struggling to become a comfortable cog in the American corporate machine, I would highly recommend Franz Kafka's America. It's certainly got its fair share of the grindy cut in a bureaucracy that makes no sense feeling that is prevalent in a lot of other Kafka's other works. But it also has a touch of this sort of romanticized American can-do spirit. So if you admired Keiko's sort of indomitable approach to the difficulties that she faces, you'll probably appreciate the protagonist's journey in America. So that's all for me today. What were some of your favorite books from last year? What are your favorite books about being a comfortable cog in the corporate machine? What's the best fiction and translation you've read lately? If you have suggestions for new segments you'd like to see in my book reviews, I'd love to hear them. Leave them in the comments below or connect with me on social media. And as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, Happy reading, weirdos.